really that this is, I think, is one way that we as wives at some point along the way can begin to empathize and understand even our husband's experience that at some point along the way for them, as you just said, there was pain. Mm -hmm. And the way that they learned how to deal with or medicate that pain uh, led to a lot of pain for their spouse. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think we have the same work to do in terms of how am I going to steward this pain in a way that um, benefits me and doesn't create more chaos and more pain down the road. Welcome to the Faithful and True Podcast. We come to you today with a special guest from our staff here at Faithful and True. Elizabeth Hardesty has agreed to give uh, us time today uh, to continue our series, Greg, that we've started about questions. Yes. And again, for those of you that are joining us or have been around for a while, we're doing a series on questions. So we've asked each of the staff um, to bring a question either that um, they hear often in their office or was important in their own journey or recovery, or maybe they just think is important to understand. So um, Elizabeth, what's the question that you brought for us today? The question today that we're going to talk about is what do I do with this pain? Yeah, absolutely. And I do think that that is um, a great question. And Let's just start with, I'm assuming that that's a question that you hear in your office. Mm -hmm. And so typically, what is the context that a woman might bring Mm -hmm. um, and want to be able to talk about that? You know, um, typically, I think the context around that is some, there's been some type of new information that has come out that's really just been catastrophic for a woman uh, in, in her, in her marriage. Mm -hmm. Or for some, it's just this buildup of pain over time of, this has been a really difficult um, relationship. There's just some components here that have added a lot of pain. Um, So areas around uh, sexual betrayal, areas around um, lying, some of those types of things Mm -hmm. that have really added to a lot of pain. Yeah, and one of the things I hear is it makes sense that we're going to hear that question at the beginning because a lot of times there's just been information, there's just been um, some sort of disclosure, Mm -hmm. and so therefore there's a lot of pain there. But what I also hear you saying is many times this question comes up later in the journey, maybe because there's new information that came out. Another situation that I could think of is the information isn't new, but they are going through a new consequence or they are reminded of an old consequence. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of the wives, it's almost as if they want to get free from this. They don't want to stay in the pain, but there's something that kind of comes up that reminds them of the pain and the chaos that they've been experiencing. Exactly. And I think just that question of what what do I do with this? You know, what are what are my options in terms of how to steward this because it feels so overwhelming. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you used that term, steward, because that ultimately I think is what we're going to be talking about. Mm-hmm. But to begin with, let's talk about what are some of the things that we don't do with the pain. Um, we have our nature to want to avoid it, to minimize it, to medicate it. And for many of us, that's how we got into the addiction, that um, originally there was a pain that we wanted to avoid. Um, There was a pain that we wanted to medicate. We discovered something that gave us temporary relief, and then that became our coping strategy that made it possible for us to avoid or ignore or temporarily deny the pain. Right. And I'm glad you're talking about that, Greg, in terms of really that this, is, I think, is one way that we as wives at some point along the way can begin to empathize and understand even our husband's experience that at some point along the way for them, as you just said, there was pain. Mm -hmm. And the way that they learned how to deal with or medicate that pain uh, led to a lot of pain for their spouse. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think we have the same work to do in terms of how am I going to steward this pain in a way that um, benefits me and doesn't create more chaos and more pain down the road. Well, and the nature of pain is my present pain quickly connects me to my historic pain. Mm -hmm. And so um, it can intensify that. So a lot of times we feel like, well, if there's been enough time, then maybe that pain will be minimized. It will just go away. It will fade. And quickly, as soon as we are triggered into pain currently, we are reminded that that historic pain that we never really dealt with is still present. Kind of the example that I would use is, let's say that I broke my arm and it really never set well. I didn't get the help that I needed initially. 
And so there's this ongoing pain that I experience, but at times it's less. Mm -hmm. But as soon as my arm gets bumped, immediately I am reminded of the pain because it's not just the bump that I'm experiencing, but it's the unhealed wound that I'm experiencing also. Mm -hmm. And I think emotional pain is like that too. It's the, the current situation may be very intense or it may be a bump, but either way it connects to the historic pain that I never really dealt with. That's right. That's right. And um, I love this thing that your wife says at the women's workshop, but she talks about, it's a quote, I believe, from Richard Rohr, um, where he talks about if we don't trans, uh, transform our pain, we will transmit our pain. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, and I think um, back to my own story, and I talk about this at the workshop as well, and just with my clients about, um, you know, in, in our story early on, Chris disclosed a, a partial bit of, of his disclosure and kind of like what you're saying, it was that broken arm for me. Mm -hmm. um, but just quickly put a sling on that, you know, like we're just going to bandage that up. And I didn't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't know how to transform that pain and right. how to steward it. Um, and and so uh, you know, what happened for me is that pain really leaking in mm. um, of quickly forgiving and just wanting to make it all better. And um, and it was it was that kind of that kept getting bumped, but just nope, nope, we're not going to deal with that arm. You know, we mm. just can't face it. And it, it just it doesn't go away. It just right. continues to transmit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, several years ago, I was asked to speak at a seminary and the topic was um, kind of the addictive culture, you know, what are the factors that contribute to an addictive culture? And I think a lot of people immediately go to the availability of coping strategies. So the addiction culture is one where there's a lot of access to alcohol or substances or narcotics or, in our case, pornography. And obviously, availability is a contributing factor. And yet I think the greatest issue that determines an addictive culture is a culture where they are told that pain can be avoided. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as I'm told that pain can be avoided, then I'm going to be looking for those strategies that make it possible for us to avoid pain. And we live in a culture where we are told emotionally and physically we can avoid pain, and it comes at no cost. And so if it's anything from a headache and it's over-the-counter stuff to something that's more intense where you need a prescribed narcotic, there's this sense that, well, I deserve to avoid my pain, so I'm going to create a strategy to avoid my pain. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, and it comes at a cost. Yeah. Um, the other piece of this, though, is we have to acknowledge that there are some theological traditions that also communicate that there will be no pain. Mm -hmm. You know, that once you know Jesus, because of Jesus' love, Jesus' grace, there will be no more pain. And so, therefore, if I begin to believe experiencing pain is actually an indication of my lack of faith or my lack of righteousness, then it's going to send me into um, a more resistance to feeling it. So I think the first thing that we would say is that pain is expected. Um, pain is a part of life. Yes. Pain ultimately cannot be avoided. Um, and pain is not the presence or the absence of faith. Mm -hmm. And we read the scripture and see that there are people who had tremendous faith that experienced tremendous pain. And so we're just going to normalize. Nobody's failing if I'm experiencing pain. Mm -hmm. um, and there are choices that other people make that are incredibly painful, and I need to be able to deal with those. Right, right. Um, what are some of the ways that you invite women to move towards their pain? Mm. I think first acknowledging um, maybe the opposite of, you know, kind of what I was just talking about of how our pain, we talk about how our pain can... Um, leak out or our pain can leak in. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we define what does that mean? You know, like what are what are some ways that our pain can leak out? And I know for a lot of women we work with, there there's a lot of rage, there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of bitterness, um, which is understandable, mm -hmm. right? Not excusable, but understandable. Right. Um, and for others of us where it, it leaks in and it's, um, I mean, we have a lot of women mm -hmm. that struggle with a lot of health issues, uh, anxiety, depression, um, so, I mean, all of those things, they make sense when we're not really learning how to steward that, mm -hmm. that pain in a, in a productive way. Right. Um, so just being gentle for, for any of us in terms of where are we in that spectrum, because a lot of times that comes out of our families of origin, too, of what we saw modeled right. um, in terms of how our families dealt with pain. Yeah. Um, and that's a good place to start is yeah. even to ask, what were the messages that I was given about pain growing up? 
how did I experience other people's pain? Mm -hmm. And what may be true is I grew up in an environment where people didn't steward their pain well, and so it did leak, and the, the toxicity came towards me, the chaos came towards me, and so it may have even increased my desire to not move towards it, but in my desire not to move towards it, then I picked the same pattern of leaking it towards the people who are in proximity to me. So maybe it just begins with acknowledging there is pain mm -hmm. and to get honest about the ways that it show up. And what, what's true is we're talking about women and the pain that their husbands have caused. What we know is it is pain that have brought men to the workshop. Right. That it's this idea that I'm using my acting out behavior to avoid pain. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when I'm working with a man and he's kind of wondering what is my next step in recovery, um, part of the question is always, where is the pain that you need to move towards? Mm -hmm. Because if I'm not dealing with my pain, then I'm going to want to medicate it, and then I'm going to be vulnerable to wanting to use my right. drug. And for a lot of the men who struggle with sexual addiction, one of the things they're trying to do is to get a temporary relief from the chaos mm -hmm. and pain, and through some sort of sexual experience, actually try to ejaculate the pain mm -hmm. that they've internalized. Mm -hmm. And so we're just going to acknowledge that there is pain, there's a cost, not to deal with the pain, and then what does it look like to really move towards it? Absolutely. And I, I think there's a lot of components in terms of what does it look like to really move towards our pain. Mm -hmm. um, one of those I know here that we really advocate for the women and the men we work with is community, mm -hmm. right? That I think part mm -hmm. of what helps us to face the pain um, and feel all the feelings that come along with that is knowing we don't have to do that alone. Right. Would you add anything to that? Yeah, well, you know, one of the things that may be true for a lot of people, and it's valid, when there's been intense pain, there is a fear that it is going to consume us. Mm -hmm. You know, that it's like it's too much. And so there is something powerful to be in community knowing that other people can not just be with me in my pain, but they can help hold the pain. Yeah. It's like a weight that together we can carry this, and especially in those places where there is a familiarity to the pain. You know, one of the, mm -hmm. power, the powerful aspects of groups here at Faithful and True is you're in a community of people who understand not just through conversation, but through their actual experiences of what it's like to be in this kind of pain. Yes. And so when a woman offers comfort, um, it's because she has been comforted and now she's expressing it. It's that scripture of comfort with the comfort you have received. Mm -hmm. And there is something deep and rich when we know that someone has experienced what it is that we've experienced. And yep. um, one of the scriptures that I often go back to is, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The reality is we want the comfort without the mourning. I mean, I often talk about addiction is an attempt to be comforted without experiencing the pain of the mm -hmm. mourning. But it's only when we have the courage to mourn that we can experience the comfort. And then once we've experienced that comfort, we have the ability to move towards other people with that comfort. That's right. So part of the reality is if I want to be a comforting presence to others, I must have the courage to be present in my own pain mm -hmm. and not be alone with that. Absolutely. It's just, it's transformative. And Elizabeth, uh, as you're dealing with uh, the women that you help, uh, is post full disclosure kind of the the pinnacle of their pain i mean mm -hmm. do, they, do they do they turn to you uh in their most painful moments uh in the aftermath of all that they've learned through full disclosure or is it just an ongoing you know pain is always there in one form or another i think it's maybe kind of what greg was saying at the beginning that um, i think there are different stages along this recovery journey uh, where pain can be maybe a little more heightened. Mm -hmm. I think often when a when a wife when a woman first comes through the doors, there is a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. Even even if they don't have the full story, don't know everything, there still is pain. True. Um, and I think oftentimes it's true that after full disclosure, when when the whole truth is laid out, I think a lot of different feelings can come up. There there can truly be hope. Yeah. Potentially, a, a woman can begin to feel hope. Um, maybe feel a, a level of understanding and knowing her husband for the first time. And yes, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. absolutely it's also true that there is pain that um, is part of that process of, of how do I steward mm -hmm. this even? Right. Right? Well, and I would say that's part of the thing that is so confusing is we can feel a variety of different things simultaneously, and sometimes they seem contradictory. So for that wife that's just done full disclosure, there may be a part of her that is in intense pain 
and at the same time is experiencing relief mm -hmm. because she believes now the information is out there or there was something that she was dreading that wasn't included that he hadn't done and so that can be very confusing and our tendency is to say let's focus on the relief and let's put a you know find the silver lining and that really ignores the significance of the pain. Right. So if there's anything that can distract us from the pain, we're going to want to gravitate towards that. So one of the things that we can do is help people celebrate the relief or to experience the hope and not to flee the pain right. that is also a part of that process. Both, both those things. That's yeah. right. I mean, I talk about at the workshop, we talk about full disclosure and... Um, you know, I remember from my our own journey through this, I remember going in the parking lot here after full disclosure and, and looking at Chris and for the first time feeling this relief, mm -hmm. feeling like I, I know like I know him. I feel like for the first time ever I know him and I am mm -hmm. incredibly angry and hurt and need space from him. You right. know? So I think learning how to hold the tension of of those seemingly opposite things at the same time and giving yourself permission to not tip one way or the mm -hmm. other but trust the process as you walk through that. Right. And I also want to identify there could be those on this journey that are in it for two or three years and something else has come up um, and they are reminded of the previous pain or maybe something new is triggered. And I think one of the things a lot of times people say is, oh, I thought I dealt with this or I thought I already felt this. And the reality is there may just be more. Mm -hmm. um, an image that we talk about is recovery is like running a marathon on a track. Mm -hmm. You end up doing the same laps over and over again, and you are making pro mm -hmm. progress. So if you're in the journey for a couple of years and new information or a new consequences experience um, or just a new um, understanding of something and you find yourself in pain again, it's not to th say, oh, I'm back where I started. It's to acknowledge, no, this is painful and I'm in a new place. And maybe what's true is I even now have more of the skills and the fortitude in order to move towards this. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you're failing at right. recovery. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you're not doing it right, right? Or you're not doing it perfectly. It's right. just being gentle with becoming curious about that. Right. Like, okay, it's time for another lap of something mm -hmm. else coming up here. And, and I've often heard the stories where people would talk about pain comes to them at times when they are more ready to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Um, I talk about the fact that if you know if you live in Florida or a place that has hurricanes, you want to build a house that can withstand a hurricane. Well, if you build a house that can withstand a hurricane category two, that's great until the category three comes along. So what we're constantly doing is fortifying and creating a stronger infrastructure so that when the hurricanes come, we can withstand them. And sometimes that hurricane five is delayed Maybe it's intuitively, maybe it's experientially, as we strengthen our fortitude and strengthen our infrastructure to receive the chaos and the pain that is coming our way. Mm -hmm. So it's almost as if there is a grace in that, that in the early days, maybe we didn't have the fortitude to handle everything. And there is a healthy disassociation that is present. But then in time, as we get stronger, we're able to embrace more and more of what is true and what is real in that moment. Right. We don't have to force it or, right. you know, plan all that. It's just it's trusting the process of knowing we will we'll face those things when it's time and, and be ready for that when mm -hmm. it's time. Yeah. And yeah. kind of a caution if people are in a group, sometimes we want people to face their pain early on. And there is a, a healthiness in that. What's also important is there's a caution in that, that we do trust that it's not about denial. For some people, it's just they're not ready yet. And so we need to be attentive to that and be with them because there will come a time where there will be that awakening. In that moment, they have an option. Am I going to move towards the pain or move away from the pain? And it's at that space, the invitation to, to move towards the pain may be able to be heard more clearly. Yeah. It really is about not forcing someplace somewhere, forcing someone someplace they're not ready to go. No, we need to be allowed to be where we are, yeah. right? Yeah. And so how does pain show up? It can show up in grief, um, just a, a profound loss. Mm -hmm. um, it can show up physically where we're actually experiencing pain. There's some great um, resources around the body and somatic therapy and the fact that our body does remember and so sometimes we're actually holding pain somewhere in our body that 
manifest itself physically, but it is more of this emotional pain that we have. Mm -hmm. um, it can also show up in that grief that leads to relief um, or that grief that leads to hope. And so there's not just one way that it happens, but just to be open to the various opportunities that we have to move towards it. And I think another big thing that I'm thinking of there, Greg, as you're talking, is the importance of um, slowing down for any of us, whether mm -hmm. it's the, the men or the women, to slow down and pay attention to those feelings. Pay attention to um, what am I feeling uh, emotionally? What am I feeling in my body? What is coming up for me? Um, because I think if we're just rushing and hurrying and, and going through life, we're not going to pay attention to um, what, what, what is bubbling up there and how do I, how do I slow down and pay attention to this, mm -hmm. right, and, and really steward this in a way to, to care for myself right. and pay attention. Well, and in the slowing down, we pay attention to what I'm doing. So if I find myself falling into old coping strategies, I'm watching a lot of tea, uh, TV, I'm spending a lot of money, I'm... I'm eating a lot of food, whatever my tendency is to do to cope, I pay attention to that and ask myself, okay, if I'm watching a lot of TV, what's going on for me? Is mm -hmm. there something that I'm wanting to avoid? If I find myself eating and I'm aware I'm not even hungry, am I falling back into some old patterns? Um, and so even observing yourself, be a gentle observer, because how I'm coping may be an indication that something is surfacing mm -hmm. that I need to embrace and move towards. Mm -hmm. And one thing I'll add to that too, Greg, is we're talking about um, our pain leaking out, our pain leaking in, the things we do with pain, the, the different ways we cope, right, mm -hmm. with our pain. I think what's also true is we are not going to do it perfectly. We're not mm -hmm. all of a sudden just going to steward that pain perfectly, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that is a big part of um, having that community, having support, having therapy, uh, being able to identify first what, you know, is this pain leaking out? Is it leaking in? Being able to talk about and process that. Um, because it is going to be part of this journey and process for us of, of finding healthier ways to grieve, to face, to feel, to address that pain and to find our voice, to find healing in right. that. Well, and it's counterintuitive to think I heal pain by moving towards pain, you know, but that really is the invitation that when I am in pain, the strategy, the next step is to move towards it. I wish it wasn't so great. I do. I wish there had been a different <laughs> system that was created. <laughs> yeah. um, an image that I use is the if someone has knee replacement surgery, you know, the reality is they are in pain prior to the surgery. And then they have surgery. Well, that creates pain. Then they go to rehab. That creates pain. Then they do physical right. therapy. That creates pain. Mm -hmm. But the reality is once I have that painful surgery, if I choose the redemptive pain, it leads to healing. Mm -hmm. And so using that idea of avoiding the pain or leaking our pain, it is pain that is recycled that keeps us stuck yeah. versus this redemptive pain that when we embrace it and steward it, it moves us forward. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the questions could be, what are some of the indicators that I am being a good steward of my pain? What are some of the attributes, the characteristics, the experiences that women will have if they are moving towards their pain? Mm. It's a great question. <laughs> it, is, I mean, it is a great question. And I think there's probably many facets to that answer. Um, it's, it's really something to start to see the women I work with enter into this place of stewarding it well. Um, I, I think one thing is they really they really like who they are and how they're showing up in it, mm -hmm. right? That they're, 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 they're finding their voice. Um, they're able to name their feelings. They're able to name what their feelings are telling them they need. Um, but they're also doing that in a way that's not, it's not having that leak in where they're mm -hmm. not, they're codependent and tiptoeing right. around, but it's also not raging. You know, it's like, I like this. I like mm -hmm. how I feel when I'm taking care of myself and stewarding this. So I think that's one thing I see is just that increased confidence and belief in themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's a confidence in their resilience. You know, that's one of the things that if we have been avoiding pain because we were afraid it was going to consume us, mm -hmm. if we're able to move towards it and move through it and move beyond it, there's this sense of resilience that does bring us hope. Yeah. You know, again, having a pain-free life is not an option. And so we know that those other storms are going to come. And if I can have some confidence that, okay, I don't want the storms, I don't welcome the storms, mm -hmm. and yet when they come my way, I have the capacity to 
survive and be resilient through the storms. Right. I'm so glad the two of you brought this around to a hopeful uh, wrap up here uh, as we've reached the end of today's podcast, uh, because we're all in the uh, mindset of, you know, displaying and spreading hope Mm. uh, in all that we do, all the work that we do here at Faithful and True, working with wonderful therapists like uh, Elizabeth and and our whole team uh, is to give hope that healing is Uh, is there for you Mm -hmm. and is possible. Uh, We'd like to thank you for joining us today on the Faithful and True podcast. We hope that today's message and today's conversation with Greg and Elizabeth has been beneficial to you. If you're a man out there that is struggling with sexual purity issues, we invite you to visit our website, faithfulandtrue.com. Check out the Men's Journey Workshop, which we offer every month. And uh, the, uh, the schedule is there. The online registration is available. And then for the spouses, uh, two to three uh, times, uh, we're starting to run out of time mm-hmm. uh, in this year, uh, but we do have, I believe, one more women's workshop uh, coming up uh, in the next uh, couple of months. Uh, and uh, take a look at the details involved there. We also have the couples workshop coming up. So we invite you to look at the details and the opportunities that we have here. Uh, Until we come to you again next week, we hope that the coming week will be a week for you that's filled with many blessings and great vision.